and I will pass it off to Suzanne and John. Thank you both for being here. Yeah, John, I'll just um, introduce you. So I'm Suzanne Gallagher. I'm a public health professor here at Plymouth State University, and this is my friend and colleague, John Martin. Let's see, you're over here <laughs> next to me, um, who uh, is co-facilitating, and um, I'm, I'm um, going to turn it over to him. And uh, he's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the active teaching lab. And I'm so, and this activity is meant to be interactive. And so, John, I'm going to let you introduce sure. yourself and it activity. Great. So yeah, I'm at UW-Madison and I do faculty development work um, for teaching. And I've really, over the last couple of years, started to focus more and more on sort of, instead of the, like, what are the buttons to press and, and how do we um, set up good quizzes and such, I, I, I focus more on how do we get more people into the classroom, feeling welcome, feeling um, connected, feeling motivated. Um, so it's really more about the how to do teaching more inclusively rather than how to do teaching, you know, sort of the nuts and bolts and mechanics of teaching. Um, so as part of that, one of the ways to practice what I preach is we've always had these faculty development programs that have been training sessions, right? You go in and you learn what buttons to press on the, on the platform and you don't learn about when to do certain things and when not to do certain things or why to do certain things. It's kind of like the new math of teaching, if you will. Um, so what we've tried to do is uh, model with our active teaching labs, this kind of interactive, inclusive environment increasingly. Um, in March, like many of others, uh, we moved fully online, uh, fully remote. And so we've slowly been trying to adapt and, and make that uh, transition. We've done it, but you know, there's always things that we're continually learning. So as part of that, um, in the chat, I've posted a link to the activity sheet. And this activity sheet is a uh, collaborative Google document. So we've got a, a structure of today's, I'll call it today's lab because I guess that's the language that I'm used to using. Um, and that's the header or the activity sheet headers got that little, let's experiment, let's try things out. Let's um, not be afraid to fail um, in, in, in a safe way, of course. So you've all logged in, great, I appreciate that. Um, on the activity sheet, uh, there is this uh, space below here for questions that you'd like us to address. Um, I will tell you right out right off the bat that I don't know the answers to a lot of the questions that you might have. Um, but I do know that you are all here and you all come with a little bit of knowledge in your own realm and your own perspective. Um, so I invite you to go ahead and answer questions that you know. Um, one of the things that I say at the Active Teaching Lab is I've taught um, for several years, but I have never taught you know, an over 500 person lecture class. So if we can get people in the room who have done that, they can answer questions or make um, applications of the content of these sessions to that sort of environment. A wet lab, I've never taught that. Um, there are all kinds of disciplines that I've not been in those classrooms. So I need you all to participate, to bring in that experience that you have, um, things that worked for you, things that didn't work for you, things that you've heard rumors of your, from your students of things that worked or didn't work or whatever. And that'll be another recurring theme, um, asking your students um, for their thoughts and ideas. Because if you think about it, they're in a lot more classes than you are. And so they've got a lot more expertise in some ways um, about what's happening than we do from our limited perspective. All right. so. Again, in the, active, uh, the activity sheet is in chat, and I see that there are several people in there already. Thank you very much. And I've got that on, let's see if I get this left and right, right here. So there's a little bit of, uh, you, you'll be able to see what's happening in it. In the labs, people are oftentimes, I will share the, the screen and we can talk directly in this, and that way I can highlight um, and jump to the parts of the document that I'm looking at um, and referring to. Um, the nice thing about this document is that all the links are active. If you get a handout, a piece of paper, those, 
those links are never active on the handouts, right? You've got to type in the URLs. So the digital worksheets are, are really a nice way to sort of structure um, things and also to get the input of your, of your students and your participants. Let's start out by talking about sort of this idea of, of, of equity and inclusion. Um, and I, I want to tie it to the, the habits of the mind. Um, at UW-Madison, we have a thing called the Wisconsin Experience. And five years ago, they said, oh, there's something special about being at UW-Madison. Um, let's call it the Wisconsin Experience. It's this unique blend of our, you know, partly the Badgers football and partly the um, campus hill that you have to walk up and part, you know, there's all kinds of things, but there's also like, we're the second most uh, Peace Corps volunteers. So there's something about Madison that encourages people to sort of be more active and purposeful in their world. About three years ago, they put these together and they said, all right, the Wisconsin experience is, we wanna foster empathy and humility, right? These are good things that we all want in our uh, disciplinary colleagues, right? We want them to understand, we want them to listen, we want them to take on multiple perspectives. Relentless curiosity is the other one. We want you to continue to ask questions, not just to wait for answers, but to go out and dig for those answers yourself. Intellectual confidence is our third one. We want our students to stand up and say, I believe this, and I want to make an argument for this. In many ways, this aligns with your uh, purposeful communication, your integrative uh, self-regulated learning. Like there are a lot of elements that they don't line up exactly, but there are pieces throughout these, right? these frameworks that our campuses have that we are already doing in many ways that we can say, huh, this is part of this inclusive learning, right? Purposeful action is our fourth one. And purposeful action um, is about, we want them driven. We want our students passionate and motivated. And that means that as instructors, in some ways, we have to help them see the connection between their passions whatever they are, and they might not be fully formed yet, right? We often, it takes college to, to, to figure out who we are and what is it that we really value. So we have to sort of help tease that out of them and then connect the content of our course to that. So throughout this session, I would really encourage you to, to look at the uh, PSU's um, habits of learning, habits of the mind and say, what does this mean as far as inclusive learning goes, as far as inclusive teaching goes? Um, anytime that we can align with frameworks means that it's less work for us to do. It's one less thing that we need to sort of add on top of what we're already doing, right? Because if we can say, I'm doing this and this lines up with this nicely, that Venn diagram is not like over here and over here. It's like, oh, it's one thing. It's the two birds, um, one stone, terrible uh, metaphor, violent metaphor. but um, we can do that, right? So let's think about what you're already doing and then just supercharge it a little bit. Suzanne, have you thought uh, about some of the habits of the minds and, and would you like to say a little bit more about that? Uh, so there, I, we, I put them, we put them in the document so you can see I broke down the habits of mind, how we usually see it into more um, structured and action oriented um, bulleted list. And uh, from here on out, when we develop new courses or when we're submitting our syllabi, we'll need to integrate the habits of mind into our syllabi. Um, so getting into that habit of thinking through the habits of mind and how it aligns with our courses is going to, you know, help be helpful and again, streamline the process. Is, is that a, a, a Plymouth State um, new policy or? Yes. Awesome. That's good. It's interesting, we've never, I think, I don't want to say we never, but traditionally in higher education, we have the, let's talk about the cognitive elements of learning, right? What are the skills that they need? How do they need to apply it? And we don't talk about Bloom and Crotwell's affective domain, the how do people value it? How do they treat each other? How do they see the world through this lens? Um, and I think that these frameworks are really starting to help us say, yeah, these are, are important. Um, the so-called soft skills, right? That's really important in a colleague, more so one could argue um, than their cognitive skills. Like we want people to be able to be kind to us and to be willing to listen and to work together. Um, so that's kind of a neat change. 
Sorry for mm -hmm. that interruption. All right. Do you feel that there's enough folks here that you oh, um, want to stay in one room or? Yeah, let's just, okay. let's, um, um, so one of the things that I will um, point to on our sheet, we've put together all kinds of, um, many of these are, are based on research. Um, if we go down the, the, the sheet here, um, I've got some ideas and right now I'm on over communicate, right? And I'm just going to go briefly through these and encourage you to do so as well. Um, many of the inclusion and equity um, seminars and trainings that I have been to have been about, and, and rightfully so, have been about taking a step back and thinking and reflecting and um, recognizing the discomfort of the world around us and sitting with that discomfort. And I think that that's an important step. I'm a white cis male, um, educated, uh, very privileged. Um, so in many ways, there's, there's a, a great deal of discomfort for me. And, 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 and like, this isn't a woe is me, how uncomfortable I am, right? But it's a, it's a, it's a thought about who am I to be talking about equity and inclusion? I've had the world in many ways handed to me on a silver platter, right? And that's, in some ways I feel like, oh, that's not my lane, but really it's everybody's lane and I need to be in that lane in order for me to be able to communicate and interact with each other. So one fraction of that lane that I can really talk about is the teaching and learning element of it. So while we are continually doing all of this self-work that we need to do constantly and continuously, um, I can contribute by saying, oh, how does the diversity framework, for example, of UW-Madison align with equitable teaching practices, what we actually do in our classroom? Because there are all kinds of folks um, saying, here's how to think about things, here's how to journal, here's how to you know, do that sort of self-reflection that we need to do they're busy doing that and there's nobody saying, and here's how to take that and put it into your classroom. In the, what do we do on Monday? How do we integrate this into the unit that we're teaching right now? And so that's, that's sort of where this activity sheet is coming from. This activity sheet is coming from. Um, so I've got a lot of things in there that are very practical um, ways that align with a lot of these, um, framework suggestions, ideas that, that come up in, in equity and inclusion. So starting off with um, over-communicate, one of the big things that you can do to help is um, request participation. And I'm gonna do that right now with all of you um, and say that if this were a face-to-face -face session, we would be talking back and forth. And I would see your um, nonverbals, um, not just on a flat screen, but in a more three-dimensional space, I guess. And I can pick up a whole lot more about that as you can from each other. In this sort of flat remote Zoom space, um, we need to augment that a little bit. So I need all of you to augment that a little bit. Um, so I would encourage you to unmic when you want to make a point or raise your hand if you'd like to do that. Um, add things to the chat if you have questions about that. One of the nice things in universal design for learning um, is this idea of multimodal uh, communication, giving people multiple means to express, um, multiple, giving them multiple representations of content um, and engaging them in multiple means. And so what we're trying to do here is you have the chat, you have the activity sheet, which is a collaborative document, you have the um, unmute and you have your audio and video that you can talk about, you've got options. Um, in some ways this can seem overwhelming. And so I love the fact that I've got Martha and Suzanne here to help me sort of moderate the chat, but I want this to be a more interactive discussion. Um, and we have enough people here now, we have nine, um, that we can, we can, you know, it's a small enough group that we can do this all in one room. I had some 
participant uh, breakout group slides that I was going to set up that you're free to look at if you'd like to, but we won't use that there. As I start off, I'm going to go through some of these um, over communicate, um, get to know your students. Um, one of the neat things about this uh, or, or neat tips is um, the second one, because you're teaching, oftentimes if you're teaching remotely, um, go ahead and use the second screen, invest in a second monitor, and then have a window of notes on your students so that you can say, oh, Nick, here's what I know about Nick. He likes X, Y, and Z. And that way, um, as I'm sharing my content, I can say, so Nick, this might work for you because of your interest in X, Y, and Z. And now all of a sudden, Nick is like, oh, maybe I hadn't thought of that. Or at, if nothing else, he's like, oh, John knows who I am. And he's paying attention to me. And he cares about me. One of the biggest indicators of student success is if they can answer the question, does my instructor care about me and my learning? If you can show that as an instructor, your job is almost half over. Um, and the students will then step up and, 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 and do more. They'll be more invested in the class. So make those connections between you and them, but also foster them between each other. So ask them to have profile pictures. Um, ask them to share their assignments with each other. Ask them to curate some information on, on whatever the content is. Instead of you finding it, ask them to go find it. What this does as far as in inclusion and equity is this helps them see that there's not just your instructor authoritarian way of viewing this information, but there are many ways of doing that. And they will go out and they will find the ones that work with them. So there's a diversity of opinion that is being shared there. You can ask them to go find the underrepresented, underrepresented people in your discipline and dig into their um, uh, their lives and their, their histories and their contributions. Because oftentimes what we see in the textbook is the canon, right? Dead white males, oftentimes, right? Um, and we need to change that. We need to see other people in our disciplines. So have your students do some of that work so that they can find the people that look and sound and feel and act and talk the way that they do. Um, and bring that to the class because you'll learn from it as well. That's the student sharing and curation. Be human. I've got my two dogs here at my side. They're um, they're fake, right? I'm I'm using this app called mm -hmm that lets me sort of move around. So it's, it's this is all a facade, um, but it is actually my office. Um, it's been redecorated since then, um, but it's kind of a it's a way for them to say, oh, John does art, and what what the heck is up with that world book encyclopedias that he's got in the background? Well, let me tell you, the world of knowledge at my fingertips. That's what it is. All right, let's keep on moving down. Ditch the time limits. Um, this is a really big one, and this is part of academia for however long. We are so afraid of student cheating that we say, oh my gosh, we need to be able to get this test done in 30 minutes, and if they can't do it, they don't know it well enough, right? That's been proven wrong over and over and over again. Um, there are there's so much information and research on that. I encourage you to look at those articles. Look at that infographic that's linked there. Uh, the funny thing about this is a, a colleague of mine, Morton Gernsbacher um, at UW-Madison, and she has been teaching online for 15 years and really inclusion is sort of her, um, inclusion and disability is her, is her, um, her, her area. So <laughs> the, the infographic's got four pages of reference for the one infographic and it's kind of, three pages, sorry. It's kind of amazing, um, but a lot of information about that. We've got an instructor on, on campus here, Marcus Brower, who also studies equity and inclusion and in, in, in educate, I'm sorry, in psychology. And so they've done these meta-analysis um, um, for inclusion. Um, one of the fun things is this idea of uh, utility value. If your students think that what you're teaching them is valuable, they will they will do that. Um, uh, they'll they'll be more invested, and they'll jump in a little bit more. So, have them find the utility value. How is it useful for them? And if they can't, 
do it yourself. Say, this is useful because X, Y, Z. Again, tie it as much as possible to their notes. I'm going to jump at the chat here. I see something happening in the chat um, from Mary. Thank you. Um, one of the fun things I get to do is, is research this stuff all week. Um, so I love to curate um, these notes and then do that translation into what are the practical elements of that. Um, because I've been doing faculty development no, Mary, for, for like five years, I've been able to collect a lot of actual um, use cases from instructors across campus. Um, so I love my job. And you could link um, if you have uh, links to in, in the actual um, up here in the um, the columns. Like yes. And offer uh, suggestions or tips or resources. That would be perfect uh, place for it if you would be open to sharing. I would love if you started uh, just type yes. some do questions you, do you in wanna, there. You want to start doing the, um, yeah, the yeah. suggestions? It's open, so um, as we're going through the overview, if you've got questions about it, jump on in there, Anonymous Leopard and the others. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add something. Great, and then once I get through the bottom of this, we'll go back and we'll address those questions. Um, this is another thing about the Active Teaching Lab that, that um, I'm sort of proud about, proud of. How often have you gone to a faculty development or teaching development session or any? professional development session with a question. Um, and then the uh, facilitator has this sort of canned curriculum and they go through the whole thing and then you leave thinking, huh, that didn't answer my question at all. Well, we don't want that to happen. So we encourage you to jump in there and ask those questions um, so that you can't leave thinking that it wasn't addressed. Um, We'll at least address them. Again, I don't know the answers all the time, but we rely on each other to, to at least address it and, and think about things. And John, you had mentioned to me this morning, and I'm going to put this in here. And um, this morning, uh, John and I were emailing, and he had mentioned um, acknowledging the land that we, that our university resides on in terms of it belonging to indigenous um, people of New Hampshire. and. Uh, he found the land acknowledgement um, site for Indigenous New Hampshire. And interestingly, I had my students and I had just been talking about this yesterday because of Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and, and we read an article about um, health disparity, but it was really about the mainstream narrative of Indigenous people being erased from history where, you know, as we know, that's not true. And so I would love to see PSU um, either acknowledge the land um, in, in our classes, but also in events that we have at PSU broadly. And this is something that um, Madison has created a land acknowledgement um, and uh, PSU is I think on Abnakai, uh, land at this point? Well, at, at Abenaki, any point. Kawas Abenaki. But knowing the, you know, the people that live and lived on these, um, in these spaces and teaching that. Yeah. And, and what that does, you know, it seems like such a small thing and maybe like one extra thing that we hadn't done for years and years and years, but to the people from those um, nations in your courses, this is everything. This is their identity. It's saying you matter. It's saying we acknowledge you. And that's, that's huge. That makes this course their course as well. And if you think about it, this is representing the people that you might not see in the textbooks, right? Unless it's a textbook about uh, Native Americans or the history of the US where they're often portrayed terribly. Um, and the same thing can be said with, you know, the LBTQ um, populations and other underrepresented um, populations. Anytime that we can highlight and say, 
look, you're important too. You're part of this. Um, that's, I think that's that's worth doing. Thank you for bringing that up, Suzanne. Yes, and I, who's the tree tour person? Is that Mary? Mary, do you want to talk about that a little? Oh, you're Mary, muted. Mary, and you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I can't believe it takes me so long to unmute sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it just occurred to me that I'm about to give this tree tour uh, another one. I think I've done six now this fall for the Plymouth Historic Society, and it's open to the public. And I'm thinking, geez, I should mention the first impact um, of the campus lands, the university property. Uh, so I will do that and talk about how they camped down where the community garden is and then they were wiped out by Lieutenant Baker and the river was named after him. And then there's this move to rename it back and a plaque. So it's a whole other piece that I wouldn't have thought of until this morning. So thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I love your tree tour. And I think integrating that, it, it, that's exactly the kind of thing that could be you know, simple yet also inclusive. Yeah, I'm going to definitely add a slide about that and some information. I was telling my students yesterday that in in my experience in Canada, when I've attended conferences or events, every event is started by bringing in um, First Nation peoples and um, having a ceremony and honoring them. Um, and there, I think I should probably find out if this is true, but in Canada, any kind of legislation that is passed anywhere in the country needs to involve First Nation people in the decision-making process. And so, you know, we know that other countries are a little more progressive than ours, but um, there's just a commitment to um, the honoring of the, the First Nation people. Well, I think it's particularly important in New Hampshire because I was in Maine and there they have five tribes and there's a lot of different, um, it's similar to your saying, uh, initiation, ceremonies at the beginning of big events and representatives to the legislature. And in New Hampshire, because we don't have official tribal designated land, it's like, oh, they all disappeared. But of course, they're still here and want to be acknowledged. So this is, um, yeah, as an environmental science and policy person, this is really eye-opening and great. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's see. Um... struggling with what to do with the reality that whenever I choose to do whatever I choose to do in class and whatever we decide to do in class, it will exclude silence, not respond to those needs of at least some or one of the students. Does, that, does the person who wrote that want to share? Um, yeah, it's Liz. Um, sorry that I've been having a lot of trouble with the Google Docs, which is you know, just one tiny example of accessibility and functionality that like, if one person is having trouble putting things into the Google Doc because they're on their phone, like that's, so I've been thinking, I just, I've been thinking a lot about how to sit with the reality of being the teacher in a world where, <laughs> um, no matter what we decide to do in a given day, in a given week, it will not, it will exclude. Yeah. Like, and, and like, yes, I under, like I want, like I understand working to sort of, <laughs> but like when I put it like this, I'm like, whose turn is it going to be today to be excluded and how to make sure I dole out my exclusions in such a way that everyone has a fair chance at, at approximating <laughs> like their preferred situation. I'm, I will confess I'm in kind of a dark place about it right now, but um, I really, uh, I don't like, I, I'm struggling with 
ex like living in that reality. Liz, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I think I'm reading this correctly that uh, the struggle that you're having right now is you're teaching fully online right now. And so this is really coming to the forefront for you because of that modality. Is that correct? Yes. Is that a correct assumption? Yes. So, and, and yeah. very much affecting my understanding of face-to-face -face as well. I think it's absolutely the yeah. same problem face-to-face. Yeah. -face. Exactly. I think and every I th day in face-to-face, -face, I think I've been trying to write about it, like the, this, the myth mm -hmm. of synchronicity. I yes. saw a post yes. online that was like some grad school was doing research and they're like, asynchronous or synchronous, what's best? And it finally hit me and it hit me finally in, this, in these terms. And I know I've not invented or discovered this, but like there is no synchronicity. Synchronicity is a myth. Synchronicity is not the same as community. Like they're in, in all in the same room together. That is not synchronous. Yeah. Like someone is excluded. And so like, I guess. So the, the reason I asked that question is because of that exact thing that you just said, which is I think the really important piece of this that um, I think something happens when you start teaching with more digital tools and when you start teaching online. And I think it's um, an aspect of the mediation of the technology. Um, it creates a space in our relationships with people that we suddenly reflect upon those relationships in more deliberate ways than we do when we're in a face-to-face -face encounter because we're just so used to face-to-face -face encounters. We don't necessarily acknowledge that complexity in the same way. And so what I hear you saying is that moving to online has actually not only is it hard online, but it's made you realize, oh, this is present all the time. Um, and I think that's true. I would say, to me, one of the values of what we're going, having to go through right now is, if nothing else, um, the fact that it's shining a light on that and that it's making us more aware of those inequities and those challenges. I don't know that there is ever a solution that will fix that problem. But I do firmly believe that if we don't acknowledge the problem exists, we're definitely we're, we're doing more, even more harm. Um, that there is some, there is some, there's something about simply the acknowledgement of it um, and the realization and awareness of it and the moving towards solutions that is, that is important. Um, and I know that doesn't necessarily comfort you or, or solve where you're sitting right now, but I do think that um, recognizing that the experiencing that you're having now is opening your eyes up to larger problems and inequities that we have to address when we are back face to face as well is important. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah, I think that in so many ways, this um, modality is helping reveal these um, inequities so much more than, you know, if we were in the classroom. So there's also all kinds of research about um, the different modalities and different populations of underrepresented students, right? There are many people, and I've always been sort of the, oh, call on me, uh, you know, I, I want to know the answer, or I've got the answer, um, and I take over the space in, in, the, in the room. Um, recognizing that it helps other people um, to be given the chance to do some text in a, in a discussion forum or on a Google Sheet, or if the Google Sheet isn't working for them because they're, they're using the, um, the phone to access it, then by all means, unmute them and give them that option so that they can have at least some choice to find out what works best for them. Um, anytime that we can give, empower our students with choice um, is good, I think. I put a link to uh, the CAST's um, uh, Universal Design for Learning, and they'll talk about this multiple means of representation, engagement, and um, different mo modalities for expressing what they know in ways that work for them. Did anyone well, that um, want to ask a question in lifetime rather than, or, or share thoughts? I, I, um, I wrote the, comment about yesterday I was facilitating an activity in which if we were all in the classroom we would be standing up and walking around and 
I'm teaching in person and on Zoom. So I had some students in Zoom and some students in the classroom and I'm trying really hard to pay attention to everyone equally. And it's just much easier to pay attention to the students in the classroom. They're right there, they're talk more talkative. And so I'm really struggling with this. Um, and so then we figured it out, like how we could do the activity with them in the classroom and acknowledging, you know, um, them but it was still really really hard and i'm not sure i did it right i we you know we collectively made the decision for how we were going to do it and if anyone has had an experience with this with doing interactive activities in zoom and in the classroom i would love to hear your thoughts at the top of the breakout sheet here i've got a oh i don't oh yes i do a link to um, the lab that we did yesterday, which was um, on breakout rooms and how to, to use the breakout groups in um, whether you're in Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom, WebEx, or whatever. But we've got all kinds of, um, we just had a discussion yesterday, um, really good options on how to do lots of different activities, both remotely and in person. So I hope that that could be a useful reference or research uh, for you. Did you uh, All right, and that was yours right there. So good. Um, for those of you that are teaching in the classroom, um, you're teaching in a physically distanced classroom, correct? And are you finding that more more of your students are bringing laptops with them? Sometimes. Because if, if that's the case, then you've got this sort of more equitable common space. You can have uh, in-person people using the laptops just as we are right now, um, where instead of looking at the screens of each other, um, they can do that for the remote students, but they can also mm -hmm. put, use, use the, the activity sheet and do a lot of that group work that we used to be able to do table to table to table um, in the classroom. And if you think about the, the technology enhance, I'm gonna call it an enhancement of, of Zoom. If you're teaching in a classroom where the tables are, are nailed down and the seats are, are screwed into the floor, it's hard to break up into the groups of different sizes and different varieties. And it always takes like five minutes for them to gather up their, their coffee and, and belongings and then move to the group. Um, in some ways, it's much easier in a Zoom situation, whether you're face-to-face -face or not, um, to just break them into groups and, and have that kind of activity. So it's kind of a, in some ways, it flattens things out a little bit more. I mean, I think that's a really good idea. I haven't tried that yet. I have had the idea, but I mean that, and it, but it also brings up another point, and that is like, you know, when I teach in a classroom, I move the chairs into a circle almost every single day, which I can't do um, very easily when half the class is in Zoom and half the class is in the classroom. And so I'm finding that I'm, for the first time in a really long time, standing right in front of the classroom at the podium, you know, um, so that the camera can see me. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's very uncomfortable for me, um, yet I haven't. So what I've been doing some of the time is turning, because we have the camera is facing me as the teacher so that they're seeing the backs of the students' heads that are in the classroom, right? So mm -hmm. I've been having my students in the classroom turn around to face the back of the room and then I go and sit down with them and then we're facing the camera and it's, it's messy. It's, uh... But the thing that I love about that is that you are then changing the power dynamics because instead of standing right. up in front of the class and being like, I'm the authority, you're sitting down with the students and saying, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful message to sort of send out um, in that way. Yes, which is, you know, in, in my field, breaking down power dynamics is part of the work. So it's- um, You're modeling what you do, yeah. Right. Um, so, but I, you know, I never did that before. Well, I, I guess I shouldn't say never, but um, it's definitely a result of the, you know, the modality, yeah. um, which has been 
in, in the way that the cameras are situated in the classroom. So quick question for the group. Yeah, I, I'd like to pull on this for the for the rest of the group. Raise your hand or make, you know, a, a, a gesture on the screen or whatever. If the pandemic and this your teaching has changed because of it, and we'll start off with that. Anyone? Teaching changed because of it? Yes. All right. Thumbs up. Good. Thank you for that one. Uh, is that Liz? Yes. Awesome. Way to use that technology. <laughs> And Nicholas, you wait to use the technology. All right, have you learned something new and awesome by being forced to teach and struggle with this new technology? Yes? All right, in some ways, this is ushering in, sometimes with us kicking and screaming, right? Um, but it's ushering in some really good new teaching techniques that we've never had to do before, so we didn't, because we're humans, we're lazy, it works good enough, why change it, right? But now we have to, and in some ways that's awesome, right? Um, and I like to focus on the awesome elements. There's a nice discussion here um, that I'm going to highlight here, deciding to ask students to share their faces on Zoom, or letting them hide their faces. So I think this is really neat. Um, and I recognize that um, it is an equity issue. The ones in the classroom have the choice or don't have the choice. The ones on Zoom do have the choice. So there's inequity there. But think about this is, again, because they're in their, they're in their homes, we're in their personal environments. The equity is all shifted around, right? If they're all in their classroom, this is a somewhat sterile, uh, place, every, you know, the walls are the same for everybody in that room, the desks are the same for everybody in that room, um, the Wi-Fi is the same for everybody in that room. Once you get into their personal houses, that all changes. Some of them might have barking dogs, some of them might have younger siblings that are screaming, some of them might have children that are saying, I need help with my, my schooling right now, mom or dad. Um, and that's not, you know, it's not a controlled situation. So how do we deal with that in a way, you know, we need to be a little bit more flexible. We need to change our expectations uh, to allow for a little bit more empathy for the situation that we don't know what's going on in their lives. Um, not that in the classroom we know what's going on in their lives, but at least in the 75 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever that we have them, we can see that they are all here, at least, you know, that small element of, of how are they doing? Well, I know they're all in here, sitting down. So they're all doing at least that well. But outside of the classroom, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. I always advocate for choice and empowering the students and trusting the students. You can ask the requests and say, I want you to participate more. I need you to participate more. Um, but if you can't, or you just don't feel comfortable today, don't. And that's respect. You know, I, I can all respect that. I think a lot of language um, when I was surveying the outline uh, is worded in a way that I want to applaud because it uh, challenges the way that I used to think we operated or that I operated as an instructor. So just uh, getting away from this culture of defensiveness or urgency or perfectionism. Um, and I remember when we flipped last spring, a, a dean or somebody said something about empathy and I just said to my students, like anything you do to participate, anything you submit, I'm gonna consider a gift. And then I just haven't really lost that. Of course, I'm on sabbatical this fall, but I'm trying to maintain that thinking as I go into spring that it is trust. I just have to say that they're gonna get out of it what they wanna get out of it. And I, I just have to make it a, rich, um, inspiring course, but I, I'm not going to have all the, um, I don't know, mandates, punitive mandates, things like that. And I could just be in la la land because I'm, it's just still all hypothetical because I'm, I, I'm not fully teaching, um, online this, this, um, fall and will in the spring, but I chose to have all my classes be online synchronous because I, as one level of simplicity, and then I figure I can offer some face-to-face -face as bonus things if they want to at some point, but anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, that the... brings up another issue around, um, I have a student who shows up to every single class and she does it because she's experiencing depression and coming to class gives her reason to get out of bed. And one of the days I, when I had a, like a, a reading quiz, I canceled class so that they could really focus on getting the quiz done and have a little break. And I found myself worrying about this one student because she so looks forward to coming to the class. And so I said she could come and sit with me. You know, um, I have a I've made my office very student centered so that they have a space in my office where they can come and work. And and so there's that, you know, we have the you know, we have students that are coming to classes not only to learn. But also because they're. Um, wanting to be around us and wanting to be around each other. And, um, and, I, and I don't think that's necessarily just in person, but also in the Zoom. I once had students um, show up and we spent the whole class period talking about our pets, you know? Um, and so well, I think it's that, that- It's good for you to say that, Suzanne, because I, I can see where that would be, the, would be true. And I could kind of forget that in terms of thinking about, well, what's easy for me? I can't- imagine figuring out how to have the class people live and then zooming at the same time but as i structure the class and the syllabus i can think about some non-required um in-person or mass to mask you know activities surely i can do that with all of my classes in some shape or form so i definitely now will do that as as something yeah. for them to look forward to maybe even there's something about the synchronous nature when we talk about the equity of synchronous versus asynchronous, um, the flexibility is a big plus one for the asynchronous, but the idea of a course rhythm and structure in their lives as they, you know, many of our students are in that traditional student age, 18 to 25, they have not yet figured out how to organize their lives. And in some ways, those synchronous meetings provides them with a structure to figure out and learn how to do that on their own. So there's something about that, the, the idea of like, this is why I get up in the morning, Suzanne, you know, for your student. This is, it's an important thing to be aware of and not say, all right, everybody just go on, do the learning asynchronously on your own and good luck. We need those spaces, Mary, um, where they can um, connect with each other. Yeah, and further, Marianne, one of the other things you said that I think is really you're not alone because I resonated so much with what you said around just being gentle and not having harsh deadlines, being understanding when they put, when they turn something in late. Um, and I, my, I, I, I guess I've always, I, I, I still have high expectations, but I've been very gentle and reminding them to be gentle with themselves. Um, and I feel like they kind of need that reminder to, be gentle with themselves because they'll get super hard on themselves when they turn something in later they need an extension and uh and so i don't and also i used to grade on attendance now i don't um well, grade on attendance i think one thing too is i said last spring like if um if you communicate with me basically i will uh, be accommodating for anything but you have to communicate with me because i need to know i for lots of reasons. And I think that's been really good because then suddenly they will uh, share these stories and what they really want to do but couldn't do. And and so I get to know them better and say, well, all right, then you have this, you know, as long as you get it in before this and they, later you wait, the less I'll have time to review it if I want to. They will do that, Mary, if you've created a culture of sharing. Yeah, and yeah. if you've changed the culture of the classroom to one where you trust them, where you're mm -hmm. open to them. Um, and oftentimes, if you think about, well, when I think about when I went to school as an undergrad, the instructor was this sort of godlike character that I would not dare approach. Even if they said, oh, come talk to me in my office hours, I'd be like, oh, I'm not worthy, right? Or it's not worth, I don't want to waste your time. You're doing all this important stuff. Who am I? I'm just, you know, I, I'm not anybody. So we need to actively create that culture um, in the classroom where they feel like 
the person does care about me. I am worth their time. We need to value the students and trust them and build that up. And that's not something you can do like, done. Hey, I made the statement on my syllabus. Come see me if you need me. It's a thing you need to work on continuously throughout the course. I think another thing, and John, you just reminded me of something that I do is I always stay on Zoom after the class ends. And I say, I'm going to be, I'm going to stay on if you need me. And almost every single class, someone, and if more than one student stays on and they need to talk to me about something personal, I'll arrange to, you know, have one and then the other. Um, but And some will stay on and just to listen. Like they just, they don't really have anything to say. They just they just want to hear what other people have to say. That's that informal space that, that's important. Well, one thing that kind of worries me is that I would hear or see the chatter on the private faculty Facebook group site about Zoom has been down for, I think it was some, in one case, it was 24 hours. And I thought, what? This is, this is a switch. And I don't know if it's because every IT's moved to UNH now or something, because I'm not following everything. but. So I'm thinking about in my syllabi for spring, just saying that these things can happen. And so here's, here's the schedule. And if we can't meet, then carry on and we'll regroup when we can. I don't know. How are you guys handling this when technology is going chaotic? Yeah, I... Um, ride, ride the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I hope that... I've had a lot of technological problems, especially at the beginning of the semester, even though I attended the tutorials and everything, I just really find that teaching takes a lot longer. You know, when you're connecting the cameras and the Zoom and the students in the classroom and all that, you know, it's, uh, and then there's the technical difficulties. Whoever was in the classroom before you might've unconnected some things and you have to make sure you have all the things plugged in correctly. Um, and I almost always students. forget to record. Yeah, yeah. They remind have, me. That's the other thing is they remind me like, oh, you forgot to share your screen. Which yeah, of <laughs> and they're happy to help that way, and they feel like they're being useful, and we we all love to feel like we're being useful. Um, so invite them to be useful. I know. I tell my students it takes a village to help me run a class. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point said, us. Yeah, Liz just said that they remind her that she's muted, which. Um, I think it happens to you a lot, Liz. <laughs> um, well, we have four minutes. John, do you have a... I just want to introduce the very bottom of the, of the activity sheet here. Um, and this is a, a thing that I'm, I'm sharing with a little bit of trepidation. Um, if you've ever read Dima Ukun's uh, White Supremacy Culture, um, I read it. And the first time that I read it, I was like, well, this, this isn't right. This doesn't apply to me. This is not the way things are. Um, Perfectionism is not that terrible. Um, once I started to recognize that it's um, also part of the capitalist culture that we're in right now, then I was able to say, oh yeah, this is like, I see a lot of these things in my work. We are encouraged to do all of these sort of terrible things because of productivity and we need to balance the budget or make profit, et cetera. So I started taking those and I started to say, all right, so what are in, um, in her article, they talk about these antidotes, um, things that you can do to sort of avoid the culture or work against that culture of perfectionism or um, a sense of urgency or all of these things. And I started to say, what are the practical teaching elements of these antidotes? How do they translate into teaching practice? Um, so I, I would encourage you to take a look at that, um, read the article first probably, and then see if they're useful to you. Um, the article, just reading the article alone is a very, some of you will be smiling and nodding the whole time and some of you might um, be like, well, I don't know, resisting it. Um, so whatever works, whether you resist it, to it. There is, it's on uh, dismantlingracism.org on the sheet and I'll just share that in chat real quick. Um, and the nice thing about that is uh, they have two versions of it, both like a handwritten uh, PDF graphic version of it and a um, text novel of it, or a text version of it. It's not a novel, it's like 
seven pages. Um, so it's a pretty quick read, um, but it's a hard read. Um, and it's a framework. It's like many of these other things, it's a framework. You're not gonna be able to say, all right, tonight I'm gonna change my classroom so that I'm inclusive and equitable. Because as was it Liz that pointed out earlier, you'll, you'll always be missing somebody. You're, we're always gonna miss somebody. But if we can plan ahead and try to be as inclusive as possible, then we don't have to make those um, reactions and address, you know, 20 individual um, exclusions that we've done, because if we can get even, you know, one or two out of that, that's easier. If we can get five or 10 out of it, if we can have a classroom where 80% of our people feel included, then we only have to worry about that 20%. Um, one of the things that we found in universal design across the board, and if you think about this, you'll see this in your lives as well, curb cuts, they were not made for you and me necessarily. They were not made for able-bodied, uh, for, for me, right? Able-bodied white male um, people. They're made for people that um, are in wheelchairs, people that need, that have trouble stepping over the, the steps. And they're used by senior citizens, but I use them too. When I'm walking down the street and I'm holding my phone and I'm reading things, if I run into a curb, I'm gonna fall on my face, right? But if I'm hitting a curb cut, then I can cross the street and just go up into the curb cut. Skateboarders use them. Uh, parents with strollers use them. The same thing happens in universal design. Captioning our videos. They're not just for the people that can't, um, that can't hear or need trouble, have trouble hearing. I use them all the time because it helps reinforce. It's the second modality. I use audio and now my visual to see the words. And it's very useful for the people that it's designed for, but also for the people that it's not designed for. And you'll see this in, in just about any equitable practice that you um, engage in. And that's all I have to say. Thank you all for, for well, being part of this. Thank you. thank you, John and everyone for attending. and. Um, Martha, do you want to share where all of this is going to be? Sure. Let me go ahead and um, stop the recording and then I'll tell you, tell you guys a little bit about what to expect. <laughs>